time of recording this, uh, we are still here on our boat in Mexico and we've decided to stay with the boat, of course, because it's our home. We also didn't like the idea at all when things started to look like borders would be closing. We didn't want to be traveling any or anywhere near airports or airplanes. Uh, so that's why we're still here. Besides that, we were also thinking about how returning to, for me, for example, returning to Canada would mean going into quarantine upon arrival. Uh, I don't like the idea one bit of posing any risk to friends and family back home. So yeah, it seems like the right thing to do. Uh, I know there's a lot of people who are having a hard time finding the means to pay their rent, uh, pay their groceries during this time. And then those individuals who are working, those working as medical professionals, those who are in the grocery stores, delivery people, even for those people who still have work, um, it's a big risk for them, of course, to be out there. Many thanks to those people out there who are out on the front lines. And again, I feel really lucky. I feel really privileged to be in a warm place. And the panic level is extremely low here. There's no panic. The grocery stores, the supermercados are full. Everything's pretty much normal for now. Thank you all for tuning into this little adventure. Enjoy! Last time, our water tanks came out of the boat, Robbie broke his head, and we removed some windows. The window work resumes as I build up thickened epoxy all around the edge to protect it from rotting. This thickened epoxy will also function to smoothen out the original epoxy layer that I made by filling in the gap using the window as the mold. Sand, smoothen, and sculpt to make sure that the window can be rebedded without a leaky gap that holds rainwater in between. For rebedding, I get some soapy water ready, because I will be using the silicone sealant that was given to us. Not ideal, but we have to prepare for the inevitable coming rainfall. I apply the sealant to both the window and the window frame, squeegee it down, and then stick it all together. We're not going to screw or bolt anything in place. I've applied sealant liberally, and I want to squeeze the window on more tight only after it dries. The soapy water allows me to smoothen everything down nicely to make sure that it's all sealed. Moving on to the next casual major overhaul, this time in the galley. Before we moved aboard, this area used to hold a mini fridge that leaked water and rotted this portion of the floor. Robbie removed all the rotten floor, he removed the flimsy shelving that was beyond my reach, cut new cubby holes for storage access around the sink, and he's also building new shelves for kitchenware. This is all rather temporary, of course, considering future plans to turn the entire pilot house into a super galley. I sanded it all down in preparation for the finishing touches, such as primer and paint. However, now because of the virus situation, honestly, paint will probably have to wait until later. We can't help opening everything up and taking a look at every nook and cranny of our boat. It started with the one little rotten piece of the galley floor and it exploded into an entire remodeling of the kitchen. Now some might say that this is all about vanity, this is all about making the boat look good, but I think it's actually about ship safety. We ended up opening an area for better access to the sink's through hole, for example. We have better visual access of the chain plates, or, or rather the, the rigging bars. Fresh off the factory floor, even if I had a brand new boat, I'd probably end up opening up a panel or two <laughs> to take a look behind, because you just don't really know your boat until you see her naked. Now time for another bonus casual major overhaul. The new owners of our friend's boat named Rafiki were coming to remove the mast. We traded our time in helping to remove Rafiki's mast for use of the crane to quickly remove our broken engine. So the crane was coming tomorrow. Time to get all the wires detached, mounts undone, and shaft disconnected. The shaft was posing a bit of a challenge, of course. <laughs> Uh, it's two down, two to go. 
almost get it out. It's a dampener. It's it stops the shocks when it, when the gear is engaged, and there's rubber inside. It's like a shock absorber in case an aluminium thing. And all that was bolted four bolts to the to the gearbox. And this is the coupling. And there I had to grind. You see, I think that was a safety mechanism they had put so the bolts couldn't come out. Mm. So I had to grind that away, and now the bolts slid, and the engine is technically. The mounts also demanded some effort, as the bolts and the feet had turned to pure rusty blobs. This is attached with a chain going around the gearbox and around the front of the engine, and it's all shackled together in a net, basically in a net. And then when the crane comes, you just have to put this. You only have to put this loop around the crane. Check at the back. Just Tecnicamente è, spa è spartene a tutto il barco. Calima! E sto passo ma spassi che pezzo anche. Termina. Buono blu! Quando termina tabla. And this crane was appropriate in size for both Rafiki's mast and our engine. However, what was proposed next had Robbie and I both pretty skeptical. When the crane rolled into the yard and the boat owners proposed to lift the boat out of the water with it, Robbie and I were, for the record, quite dubious. I filmed hesitantly as Robbie positioned himself under the hull. It's right about here where our suspicions were confirmed that the crane was too small for the job. This was going to be one hell of a mess to clean up. The boat that usually sits in the slip was waiting on standby, and there were no free spaces to be used anywhere on the canal. So the crew called in a second crane to help the first one. And the crane guys would have to do some real acrobatic acts to precariously attach the second crane to the first one. It's quite lucky that the truck didn't slide into the water with the boat, and it's extremely lucky that nobody was hurt. But the risky stuff didn't end there. Stress levels were high as the crane operators had to move their arms in tandem. With poor Rafiki helplessly swinging around in the air, the attachment points were by no means very secure. And even with the strength of two cranes, it was apparent that at some angles, the weight of the boat could still tip one or the other crane over again. With the help of some boat stands, and when the boat was more or less centered over the crane's truck bed, the second truck would have to detach and move into another position in order to drop the boat onto its trailer. Some more Mexican tightrope walking. But you have to admit, these guys were determined to correct their miscalculations and get this boat onto the trailer by any means necessary. Inch by excruciating inch, the cranes strained to place the boat in between them. Stop, 
Now, if only the trailer was large enough and strong enough to hold the boat. But we'll worry about that some other time. It was time to worry about some little things. We had installed almost all of our rigging. This is the new pin, the new modified pin we made to go up the mast. So you're going to have to do it. You're going to put this one inside the mast. From one side, this is going to go through. That's going to be on the aluminium. Then you're going to put the sleeve like this on the other side in the hole. And then you're going to put the pin in. I'm going to set you up the cable. You're going to remove this one. Pass the eye of the cable through. Put the pin back in. You're going to open each pin for now, just 15 degrees. And later I'll see whether to butterfly them or not. If anything can, can get stuck on them or but whether or not this headstay toggle was going to fit along with the constructed sleeve so that the pin would not jiggle was all up in the air. The best part now was that we could test fit the old Genoa that Tony gifted us that he had dug out of the old stores of his workshop. It's a little bit small, but the furling one was about the same size, so no power lost really. Tef gelling our turnbuckles. Tef gel is a Teflon based lubricant that prevents seizing and corrosion between metals. Which is obviously something that can happen quickly with your rigging, as demonstrated here on our brand new rigging, because we didn't Tef gel it earlier. Yeah, it's squeaking. That's what we're trying to prevent with Tef gel. are you going to apply Robbie? Like I, I, I know that oh that's more or less where it's going to to sit so I'm gonna put it in that in that section so basically this one half same thing this one about half of the turnbuckle we also had a little bit of maintenance to do on our canine friend our neighbor's dog went into her first heat so we had to have Choco tied up for about the span of a week, during which time we managed to track down a vet who could do something about it, who specifically could give him a vasectomy. And we have a lot of people ask right away, why a vasectomy? Well, we didn't have any behavioral issues with Choco. We didn't really want to change his behavior or personality, um, i.e. aggressiveness or energy level and um, neutering tends to slow down for sure a dog's metabolism. We didn't want that. We kind of looked for the only possible way that you can make it zero chance that he makes more puppies, but without changing life for him. The vasectomy was really simple. It involved really small uh, incisions, and we liked that it was gonna heal fast and basically not change much. It was a couple bucks more than neutering and basically after an afternoon of being at the vet he came back just kind of sleepy and none the wiser. The vet also gave us the rundown on what we would need eventually if we were going to travel with the dog on the boat, the paperwork and most importantly the microchip that is basically like his passport. Now we have had uh, people argue, and the vet uh, told us this, if you don't cut off your dog's balls, that your dog is more likely to have ball cancer. And I guess basically that happens if you don't remove an organ on your body, you are more likely to be able to get cancer on that organ on your body. So there is that. Sometimes we babysit our friend's big hulking dog named Django, and then the neighbor's newly fixed girl comes over to play for hours with him. This, of course, does not go over well with Choco, who is immensely jealous.
No, you such a sweet dogs. You such sweet dogs.